Oh, wow, I really can't see, which is so awesome. Um, no offense. Um, okay, so I'm going to read from my letter. Um, and uh, just one note in the first frame, you can advance it. Um, that woman is supposed to be Kena Williams. I don't know if anyone knows her, but um, I drew that from pictures that I'd seen of her on. Uh, on the internet, and um, when I looked to find out how, how to pronounce her name, which is not how it's spelled, um, I noticed that she actually had a ponytail, so if anyone knows her, I didn't intentionally take her hair off. Um, anyway, here it goes. So, not long ago, I read about an accident on Highway 101. A big rig overturned, stuff got spilled, and there was fire. One of the other cars on the road was driven by a young William named Kena Williams who saw it all happen in her rearview mirror. She saw the truck driver collapse only feet away from his burning cab. She pulled over, left the safety of her car with her five-year-old daughter in it, went to the wreckage, and dragged the man away, saving his life. Sometimes I fantasize about getting into dangerous situations. I'm always the hero. I always fight the bad guys, maybe busting out with martial art moves. I don't actually know any martial arts. But I've seen so many movies where the Asian person automatically knows karate that somehow it seeped in my fantasy life. My fantasies aren't what I want my reality to be, however. In a perfect world, I would calmly remove myself from the bad situation, get away safely, and find someone who could actually help. I've called 911 so many times. Once, I was at a party and we were flicking our cigarette ashes out the window. Someone noticed that a wish below us was smoldering. I bravely made the call. And it wasn't until we were ogling the firewoman that it occurred to us that maybe we were responsible. <laughs> One time I called 911 when a man fell down a flight, of cement, a, a flight of cement stairs. I could hear him down there howling in pain, his echoes bellowing up to my window. The operator asked me to check on him visually, but my feet were planted, roots as deep as China. So instead, I called to another man. Is he breathing? I asked him, even though I could hear him yelling, and many other things the operator wanted to know. The ambulance took a million years to get there, even though we were right next to a hospital. I wondered if they would have gotten there much faster if I hadn't mentioned he was homeless, and I regretted it. Another time, I called 911 after watching a motorcyclist skid down Jones Street, hundreds of pounds of metal sliding down with him on top of him. The asphalt was slick with the first rain of the season and oil from his bike. That day I saw something that haunted me for months after they lazily carried away his body, something that kept me from looking out that window for many rainy days to come. Thankfully, the white noise of time has not only obliterated that image from my brain, but also made me forget what it is I even saw. I try not to dwell on it, some things are best forgotten. I walk around the city always ready for action. Where will I run to if the earth begins to shake? What will I do if that man over there approaches me, asks to use my phone, demands money, grabs me by the throat? If he takes my purse, I'll let him have it, won't I? I like to think so, but I honestly don't know. One spring day, years ago, I was walking down the Ohlone path in the nice part of Berkeley, headphones in my ears, not really being a part of the world. As I neared the BART station, I kind of noticed a group of teenage boys gathered around something. This memory is soft-lit and slow-moving, even though it happened fast at the time. As I came close, the boys parted into a half-circle, one of them saying something I couldn't hear because of the music in my ears. He was pointing his gun at me, and all I could do was smile, nod, and keep on walking. <laughs> Did they call out to me? Did they lose their nerve? What were they going to do? Shoot me in broad daylight? No, they didn't but I didn't know the answer to the other questions, and I never will. The reality of the situation didn't hit me until I was underground, waiting for my train. Suddenly, the air left my body, a ton of emotional bricks smashing my lungs and telling me to move back to the city, because it's so much safer here, right? <laughs> Looking back on this is so disconcerting. There had been no split second to make a decision. My reaction just was. Peering back at that memory is like watching a stranger. I have no idea what she was thinking. If she was being tough or stupid. I wonder if that's how Kena Williams feels. Does she look back at her actions and wonder who that gal was that dragged that man to safety? Here's another memory. The 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. I was working in a little sweatshop in a rickety Sausalito Pier with three other teenage girls. 
We pressed vinyl wallets, burning hot plastic college logos onto them, the chemicals searing our already drug-damaged brains. I thought it was funny that us high school dropouts carried cheap wallets that said Hale and, uh, Yale and Harvard. My shift was almost over and I was riveting the last wallets in my batch when the tiny wooden hut, filled with heavy metal equipment, started jolting back and forth. The skin chick and the hippie girl hugged and cried, standing in the middle of the room. My friend, who used to be a Girl Scout but now dated skinheads who treated her badly, ran with me to the door like we'd been taught, filled with gleeful adrenaline. <laughs> Once the world stopped shaking, my boyfriend tore around the corner to save us, but we were too busy laughing to appreciate his valor. I was worried about you, he said, and kissed my forehead, as if I were 16 and still a child, with no concept of danger. Oh, right, I was. <laughs> But things change, and we lose our nerve, or at least I did. Fifteen years down the line, I was on the 26th floor of the luxury hotel in Tokyo, yelling at my abusive boyfriend, or about to. It was one of those apocalyptic fights where I thought my brain was going to fly in my skull from all the rage, so when the world started to sway, I thought it was my doing. Weird, huh? It wasn't until I noticed the clack, clack of the lamp's cord swaying that I realized what we were in the middle of. In an instant, my life's camera zoomed in, and the background pulled away like at a pivotal moment in a horror flick. All of a sudden, my priorities were clear, and I knew where this man fit in the scale of things. I could feel the physical distance, inch by inch, between myself and the love of my life, who happened to be my little black cat in San Francisco, waiting for me to come home. The boyfriend and I stopped fighting for the time being, but that earth-shattering moment didn't break any new ground. I was no hero. In fact, I spent the rest of that trip staving off panic attacks. I wouldn't feel right for a long time, even with Kitty back in my arms to save me. That's us being reunited. <laughs> it took me way too long to remove myself from the situation with the abusive boyfriend, to pull myself from that burning vehicle. That time, I was paralyzed. Sometimes, the danger is just too overwhelming. What would you do in the event of an emergency? Would you pull over and risk your life for a stranger? Would you call for help? Would you even save yourself? Thank you.